Last time on Shooting and Pooting. Activate the thing, Eddie. All right, boss. How long has he been here? Here! Where'd my wonderful audience go? D did I lose weight? Um, I, I can't stand up. I'm completely flat. I don't have any legs or arms. My mouth is on the side of my body and I only have one eye. And my vision is limited to only being able to see a slice. I'm a second dimensional creature. Oh, then my audience should still be able to see me! Roll the intro! <laughs> Hello and welcome to Shooting and Putin. I'm not sure what we're gonna be talking about today since I'm currently stuck in a two-dimensional plane located on my table, but I'm sure we're gonna figure something. Where's that ghastly noise coming from? Oh look, a one-dimensional person. Well, of course I am, there's only one dimension. Wow, who knew the entire first dimension was located on my table? Table? Well, you see, wait a minute, I know this. I've seen this before! This is like Flatland! I can review that! How convenient that I built a TV into my table. Flatland? What are they gonna come up with next? Well, Flatland is a book written by this handsome guy, Edwin A. Abbott, in 1884. And it's about what life would be like living in the second dimension, and what kind of society would develop. But you don't wanna hear me talk about a book! I don't? But I have good news for you! There was an animated movie made for it 123 years later, so let's get into it! The first thing I know you're thinking about... The art style and character design. It isn't super appealing. And yeah, you got a point, but I don't think it's meant to look that nice. In a way, the designs are a perfect translation of how the characters are described in the book. Yeah, even the organs. From your perspective, maybe it looks like the designer said, Uh, just use the circle tool. But the characters being perfectly symmetrical is actually integral for the story. And on that note, the story. It's the year 2999, and this guy, yeah him, his name is A Square. Not a square, A Square. That's him, get used to his face. He's a lawyer, married and has six kids. And he seems pretty content with how his flat world works around him. But A-Square's hexagon son, Hex, is frustrated with how he's meant to know what shape a person is without touching them. Seeing what shape someone is can be hard because in the second dimension you can only see a slice of what you can see in the third one. The movie shows us a rough sketch of what they see. And already here in the first scene we can see that they cut to these black screens with text that work as a substitute for a exposition dumping voiceover. And some people will probably complain about literally telling the audience how stuff works instead of just showing. I wasn't gonna say that. But believe me, buddy, if you're watching this without reading the book, like you probably are, you're gonna need it. For example, all women, including A-Square's wife, are very thin rectangles. And they're so thin that when viewed from the front, they can be hard to see. And since they're so thin and sharp, you can walk into them and die. To try and prevent too many shapes from dying, the government has enabled laws that force women to do what is called a peace cry. And it basically boils down to having women scream all the time, just so men can know that there's a female in the area. So women can only be a thin rectangle shape. Why? I don't know. I guess it just was Edwin A. Abbott's weird, weird vision for the story. No, you don't get it! The story won't make any sense if all the women aren't thin rectangles! Sounds legit! While we're on the topic of people screaming, the voice acting. The performances are overall pretty good if you ask me, and they really do carry the subpar animation. I especially like the voices of our square hero, and a certain spherical dimension hopper you guys haven't met yet. The women voices can get annoying, but that's kinda the point, so I guess it's okay. They also don't talk a lot, so there's that. Uh, is this the meeting for mentally unstable squares? A squares younger brother, B squares here. A square and B square. I wonder how long it took their parents to come up with those names. 
What the fuck did we name this one? As a lawyer, a square has to defend people, and he's going to defend the first accused female chromatist in court. But B Square is kind of a dick and isn't a fan of A Square defending her. I have no idea what you've been talking about the last minute, but this was the last straw. What the funk is a chromatist? Well, there is this expression everyone uses in Flatland, attend to your configuration. And with a slogan like that, you'd hope everything would be configured. And for the most part it is. But recently, A Square's country has been very politically divided between the government and the chromatists. I still don't know what that is. Basically, they're the normal Flatlanders Echo Fighters. They are shapes that have changed their color because they want to be able to express themselves. All Flatlanders have the ability to change their color, but the president, this guy, thinks their society is better off without individual expressionism. Everyone should just look the same and act the same. What? There are even hospitals that are purely dedicated to fix babies with irregularities. It's called reconfiguration, and these procedures can be lethal, and one of the president's own children died because of it! Why did the newborn baby have a crown? Crown? If you don't get this operation, you'll be shunned by the president, and therefore the society that orbits around him. And the president's argument against allowing people from changing their colors is that it will become too easy to impersonate each other. Not to be rude, but most squares already kind of look the same. Both of them being magenta wouldn't make it much more complicated. This guy doesn't seem so smart. But while we're on the topic of the president and squares, B-Square! Again! B-Square is the president's right-hand man, and all we ever see him do at work is tell the president that his speech is good and watch the president from far away. What even is in Ow, Squire? Oh yeah, A-square. He was going to defend the first female chromatist. He was going to meet her at the prison she was being detained at. It didn't go so well. The first thing we should notice is that she does not look like a chromatist. She is very white for a chromatist, and she claims she isn't one. So why is she here? According to her, she was arrested for failing to use her peace cry, but we don't actually get time to think about it because she starts going on an existential rant talking about some other plane of existence and before we know it, she kills herself. Ugh, yikes. After witnessing something that traumatic, there's only one thing that can put your mind off it. CONSUMERISM! The first thing A-Square does after that whole incident is go shopping at the black market. He almost buys something called a Glow point. All they do is glow, and they're really expensive, because they were smuggled over from the Northern Kingdom's border. W what's a north? It's a direction that is non-existent in your dimension, and the Northern Kingdom is a chromatist kingdom that A-Square's country is on the brink of war with. Anyways, while A-Square is trying to buy happiness from a guy with static eyes, the president is committing mass genocide on chromatists, proving to the chromatists in the Northern Kingdom that he's not weak. Wow, this guy really doesn't seem to be so smart. Imagine trying to earn the respect of a chromatist kingdom by killing large amounts of chromatists. That just sounds like a good way to get your country invaded, but we'll get back to that. Right now, A Square is trying to get home and not get killed by the military while they're on their chromatist killing spree. In the middle of the chaos, A Square meets yet another person talking about another plane of existence. But before he gets the opportunity to interrogate the guy, he's dead. This animated movie about shapes has a weird amount of death in it. But thankfully, A Square makes it home in one piece. That night, A Square has a dream about trying to explain the second dimension to a one dimensional monarch. It feels very familiar for some reason. I don't know how you can find it familiar, since there is only one dimension! Ugh. The next morning, it's New Year's Eve, and the radio says that the chromatists are to blame for all the chaos and death the day before, and everybody knows that state-funded news is the best source of information. So A-Square actively hates chromatists now. Even though he was downtown when all this happened and should have noticed that the people doing all the murdering weren't chromatists. But apparently, Hex is a little out of the loop. He just comes barging into the living room with all of his sides colored like a chromatist. 
So A square tells Hicks that he probably doesn't want to associate himself with killers. And Hicks is like, shit. Up to this point, the movie has hinted at Hicks being a closeted chromatist. But I haven't mentioned it to you guys, because it's hard to rewrite those parts of the script with no hands. Oh, I still have no idea what a chromatist is. B Square's wife tells A Square that B hasn't been seen since yesterday, so A Square has to investigate. On his way downtown, he stumbles upon the static eyed salesman he met yesterday. He's dead. Actually, quite a lot of people are dead. Instead of being in a state of shock, A Square steals one of those glow points. We all have our own coping mechanisms. When A Square arrives at B Square's workplace, they refuse to let him in. Or even tell him if B Square is alive. That isn't concerning at all. Let me in. Let me in. So A Square heads back home. Home. Are, are you really asking me to define the word home? I guess. I really don't have time for this. When A Square comes home, Hicks starts asking geometry questions. Like a nerd, he asks what 3 to the 3rd power means in geometry, and if you focus in math class, you should know that it means the 3rd dimension. Or not, I don't know what they taught you in your school. In Flatland, thinking about the 3rd dimension is the same as thinking about the 4th dimension for us. It is hard to imagine, and the 3rd dimension is so far away from their experience of the world, so the wonderful Flatland government has made a law that prevents people from both believing or discussing the third dimension, because of course they have. So A Square tells Hex to stop talking 3D nonsense. But what even is a dimension? Well, for our purposes, it's a direction. So zero dimensions is a singular point. The first one is a line, two dimensions is a flat plane, with all of the directions of a compass on it. And the third one introduces up and down. And you're in the third one, but I'm stuck here, in the second one. My brain hurts. Thankfully, A Square is getting a math tutor. How do you know that? Because that text narrator I mentioned earlier spoils what happens in this scene. So yeah, a three-dimensional sphere guy jumped into Flatland and is now in A Square's living room. Best crossover ever. If a three-dimensional object, let's say a hand, were to enter the second dimension, from the perspective of a flatlander, it would first look like a group of four objects spawned out of nowhere and eventually merged into one, while a fifth object also spawned. So in short, flatlanders can only see a slice of what we see. Got it? No! Good. Since a square can only see a slice of the sphere, he thinks it's a circle, but the sphere cleverly named a sphere starts spouting the three-dimensional truth. But none of this is registering in A-Square's flat little head. You stupid! A-Square gets tired of trying to explain, so he literally carries A-Square out of Flatland and into Spaceland. A.K.A. the third dimension. When you started talking about the second dimension, it was somewhat amusing. But all of this talk about the third one, you talk as if you actually believe this stuff. Well, excuse me, but I'm trying to talk about a movie into the empty void that is YouTube. Well, you're the person that started talking to me about whatever you say. You know what? I'm gonna put you in the box of shame. Box of... <coughs> Where were we? When A Square is in the third dimension, he finally starts to understand it. And they have a massive vibe session where A Square asks how some stuff works here and A Sphere explains it. You've probably noticed the somewhat jarring art style shift from the second dimension to the third one, but in a weird way, I'd say that this art style has more in common with the 2D one than you'd think. For example, the lip syncing in the 2D parts is just kinda flaps up and down, and they carry that over effortlessly to the 3D scenes. And overall, I kinda like how it looks. But I'm not a fan of this attempt of a smile! <laughs> I think the reason why a sphere has such a shiny and reflective surface is just to visually showcase stuff that can't be physically done in 2D, and just to communicate to us, the audience, that he's more important compared to other 3D characters. Apparently, a sphere has some sort of mission he needs to perform, and a square just kinda has to tag along. So, okay, so remember me saying it was New Year's Eve? 
Well, apparently there's a millennial meeting where every 1,000 years, an apostle of the third dimension comes to Flatland and tells the Flatlanders what's up. And obviously, that apostle is a sphere. They arrive above the Flatland government place, and the president is talking about how they have to kill the prophesied three-dimensional apostle. This makes a sphere realize that only informing the government and one civilian about the third dimension once every 1000 years at a time maybe isn't the best way of keeping people that don't have any convenient way to pass on information down for the generations informed. And B Square is there, so he isn't dead. That's cool. A Sphere dips back into Flatland to spread the three dimensional truth. But all he gets in response is unsuccessful attempts at murder from the guards. A Sphere just kinda gets fed up with it and gives up, and he ascends out of Flatland. When he does this, the president thinks they killed him, and now with the A Sphere dead, the president can't have any witnesses telling the public about this. So the guards all get executed by some other guards that weren't originally in the room where it happened. And all non-guard people in the room get told that they can't ever speak about this. According to the president, B-Square should also be executed like the guards, but since he's been loyal, he's only getting life in prison. Damn. A-Square is just kind of watching off this unfold without being able to do anything about it. Of what we see B-Square do at this meeting, it doesn't even feel like he even needed to be there. I think the president just wanted a reason to fire him without making it awkward. But yeah, A-Square is doing his best at getting their attention, but A-Square is just kind of like... Your brother is expendable. And then, they play the rice The Incredibles. Cue the triumphant return! <laughs> On that note, the music. By all means, the background music is pretty good for such a small production. Good job, Mark Slater. But bad audio mixing is kind of a running theme in this movie. Sure. A Square has been taken to some city, and apparently A Square is some kind of celebrity around here. He works at Messiah Incorporated. Not really a subtle name. Seemingly, there are a bunch of people that like A Square here, but there are a bunch of people that don't like him or what he does. Well, essentially, he researches Flatland. He probably does something else, but that is the big thing people don't like him doing. A lot of people in the third dimension, aka Spaceland, don't really like Flatland, and they think that instead of informing the Flatlands about the third dimension, they should just end their suffering. And A Sphere taking A Square into Spaceland is actually kind of a big deal, because something like this has never been done before. If those A Sphere haters knew about this, they wouldn't be happy, but they don't know, so we're good. A Sphere has to write a mission report, and he attaches a little picture of A Square to it. And while he does that, these women welcome him home. I just wanted to mention them because all the women in Spaceland are octahedrons, and in my opinion, it works well as a parallel to the women in Flatland. After the mission report, A Sphere and A Square have another huge vibe session, where A Sphere explains more three dimensional stuff. A Square is amazed by the third dimension, but he wants to see more. He wants to see A Sphere's insides. Hot. More specifically, he wants to go to the 4th dimension so he can see the insides of 3 dimensional objects. Like how he can see the insides of 2 dimensional objects from the 3rd dimension. But A Sphere rejects the very idea of there being a 4th dimension. Just like how A Square rejected the 3rd dimension. And how that monarch rejected the 2nd dimension. And how this monarch rejected both. <coughs> Whoa shit! He's been in there for quite a while, hasn't he? Hey, little buddy! Sorry about that, I don't know- DON'T! Talk to me! They are rejecting dimensions. They're basically just rejecting the unknown. And that's pretty understandable. The unknown is a pretty normal fear. But if the existence of the second dimension is a fact in the third dimension, the idea of the fourth one being totally discarded is kinda dumb. But all this 4th dimension talk really reminds me of this movie's and book's strongest ability. Making you think. I haven't seen any other piece of media that has made me think the same amount or in the same way as Flatland. Flatland the movie and the book has quite a lot of subjects it explores. But my favorite might be that it makes it easier for people to imagine what a theoretical 4th dimension could look like. 
They make a comparison between the transition of 2D to 3D by using a playing card to represent 2D. And then they start stacking more cards, making it 3D. And then to make a 4th dimensional cube, aka Tesseract, you would need to somehow stretch a series of cubes in a new direction. But sadly, no matter how much you research about this stuff, no matter how many times you read the book, no matter how much you analyze this movie, you'll never, ever see the 4th dimension. Remember that photo a sphere took of a square? It leaked and the people of Spaceland are not happy. Shit. Like in every animated masterpiece, they have to go to court. And a square needs to single-handedly prove to the jury that Flatland doesn't deserve to be demolished. No pressure. The judge scolds a sphere for being so irresponsible by bringing a Flatlander into Spaceland without being 100% sure what kind of consequences it would have. But they're all still alive, so that's good. But they're not there to question the judgments of scientists. They're there to decide if they should euthanize Flatland or not. But instead of saying stuff like all the individual lives in Flatland doesn't deserve to die, a square starts rambling about the fourth dimension. But they don't have time for any of this, because some of the nation has threatened them with war because of Acefear's actions. Shit. I guess this other nation is the 3D parallel to the Northern Kingdom. A square starts to freak out. Not because he might die in a war, because his body isn't used to gravity. So it just kinda starts warping. So he has to get back to Flatland. Fast. After all he has seen, A square does not wish to be brought back into Flatland. But he has no choice in the matter. The city is under attack and a sphere sends him back in an envelope. Basically as soon as the envelope leaves Messiah Inc, they get fucking nuked. In the explosion, we the audience see a sphere's insides. Just like a square wanted to. How poetic? Deep. So a autopiloting ship is trying to deliver a square home. But it kinda crashes with some aircraft thing. Thankfully, they crash above Flatland, so A Square just kinda falls down there. Less thankfully, he kinda crashes through it. And he falls through a bunch of maths. But then he wakes up back in Flatland. As anyone that has had their entire view of the world changed, he cries in a corner. Oh no. Oh no. Oh! No! 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 And it fades to black. And then, it cuts back to the exact same scene where A Square's five other kids I haven't really talked about are excited for the new year. 3000. One very, very small detail I really enjoy is kinda hard to describe in words, but I'll try. When A Square falls back down to Flatland, he falls on the opposite side of the one he was born on. It's easiest to see when looking at how his eyes don't really fit into his bed anymore, and when he's talking to B Square. And about that, the first thing he wants to do is go and visit his imprisoned brother, B. At the prison's door, he tries to trick the guard saying that he's B Square's lawyer. Which he isn't. But he gets rejected. Luckily, B Square's wife is here to distract the guards, so A Square can sneak past them. Once in B's cell, A Square says that he'll be able to get him out of here, since he witnessed the whole thing where B got unfairly arrested. And then A Square starts ranting about the third dimension. But B Square isn't a fan of being executed, so he punches A Square so hard he faints. That really feels like an overreaction, right? An emotional episode like that is punishable by death! Yeah, of course you think that. When A Square faints, he has kind of a vision dream thing, where he and A Sphere tries to explain to the monarch of zero dimensions or Pointland that there exists stuff outside of his point, but they don't really get through to him. At the end of the thing, Acevere gives A Square advice on how to spread the gospel of 3D, but giving advice doesn't make it any less illegal to discuss the third dimension. When he wakes up, B Square is snitching on him. Not cool. So now A Square is on the run from the government, and when I'm saying from the government, I really mean it. I could count up to 81 guards chasing this one square. Kind of a waste of resources for a society on the brink of war. Then A Square meets this guy again. Wait, didn't he die? He did! Now he died again. Imagine dying twice in the same week. Heh, <laughs> how embarrassing. A Square runs home and tells his wife to start packing because they need to move to the Northern Kingdom. While she's doing that, A-Square goes to Hex and tells him that Hex was right and he was wrong. 
And then all of a sudden... FBI, open up! The military is inside A-Square's house. Thankfully, A-Square has the flat world's most dangerous tool to his disposal. A woman. He's a tricky little square. Oh, gentlemen! I am woman! Hear my war cry! Back, back! Get back! Get back! It's a woman! Back on! It's a woman! Watch out! Watch out! Get back! Back! It's a woman! A-Square escapes and tells his family to meet him at the border of the Northern Kingdom. But when he gets to the border, the Northern Kingdom attacks. I hate it when that happens. But then all of a sudden, people start to despawn, and A-Square ascends, and he turns into his own eye, and then... Greetings, A-Square. <laughs> So that was Flatland. What a roller coaster of e I've had enough of your tomfoolery. You've barely even talked to me. You put me in a box. I don't even know what a box is. Worst two dimensional messiah ever. Oh god, I kind of forgot you were here. Almost as if you were only put here as an afterthought to make my video more interesting. I'm so sorry. Is there anything I can do for you? Huh, <laughs> don't think so. Ah! I'm 2.5 dimensional again, and I'm not tied up. Oh my god, w was it all a dream? W wait a minute, you're still here? Yeah, Austin drove off in the Shrek mobile without me. But if you are here, then that means <laughs> it was real. Greetings, eh, poot? My name's Otis. Really? I'm sorry. You're really big. I didn't even realize the roof went that high up. My name is A. Tesseract, but you may call me Tessie. What the hell's going on? Just some interdimensional travel. Gotcha. Okay, Tessie. What do you want from me? I was wondering how you could find enjoyment in the 2007 adaptation of Flatland. It's so weird. Well, I was gonna get to that, but I have some things I wanted to say first. So... So I'm gonna continue where I left off. Okay. So that mysterious voice. I think it's a four-dimensional shape contacting a square. But I wonder what's gonna happen to his family waiting at the border now. Mom, I don't think he's coming. When it comes to being accurate to the book, this ending is kinda random. In the original book, A-Square gets arrested for his beliefs, and the entire book is written inside of A-Square's prison cell. But the idea of A-Square actually getting to meet a four-dimensional shape is pretty cool. The movie is overall very good at being accurate to the book, actually. The first ten chapters of the book is basically just world building, and I don't know how, but the movie is able to build all of that into the story. It's actually kind of impressive. Everything in Spaceland is new. In the original book, all we ever get to see in Spaceland is a sphere, no other living shapes. But I really like the decision to show the three-dimensional society. It works well as a parallel to Flatland itself. I actually own the DVD for this movie, and let me tell you, it's the gateway to one of the deepest rabbit holes I've ever stumbled into. So this movie has one of those weird thin DVD cases? Sure, you can see the creator's name here. Lad... Eh Lad Hellinger Jr. I'll just call him Lad. As you can see, it's the special edition DVD, and to my knowledge, the only edition. But the thing that makes it so special is that Lad himself has signed the disc, and it comes with a really cute message. Thank you for watching Flatland. I hope that you enjoy it and will recommend it to others. Feel free to email me with your thoughts. Oh, and check out my next movie, Hive Mind. Hope to hear you from your dimension soon. Aww, how sweet. Right? On the message, we can see a mail address. Feedback at flatlandfilm.com But it likely doesn't work anymore, and this was 14 years ago. I don't know if Lad still wants people to contact him about this movie. Typing it into Google takes us to flatlandfilm.com Nowadays the site looks like this.
but if we fire up the good old Wayback Machine, we can travel back to the distant year of 2007, when I was 3 years old. The site looked like this. Huh. They have so much content here! They have merch! I want that shirt! They have a making of section! You can read the original book straight from the site and download it in multiple formats, including a Word document! They have a FAQ section and everybody's favorite, legalities. Legalities? This movie might not be that bad after all. On the site it mentions how the movie was mainly advertised on YouTube and MySpace. Huh, with a strategy like this, how come not a lot of people know about this movie? Lad even created MySpace profiles for some of the characters. True dedication. But the biggest takeaway I got from this whole site can be found in the FAQ section. Under the third question, how close is the book to your feature film adaptation? Lad says that there are three themes they needed to stick to. Flatness? Eh, makes sense. Check. Satire? Check. And the important one, Transcendence. To my mind, the original novel's deepest and most interesting core was the theme of Transcendence. To strive for it, to achieve it, and ultimately, lose it. Check. That perfectly summarizes the story. Flatland is the story of a man getting dependent on something he didn't even know he wanted, and it getting taken away from him. And Pac-Man was there! I love Pac-Man! I now see why you like this movie so much! Thank you, Apoot! If you haven't noticed, I'm very passionate about Flatland, the book and this movie, but I am aware that this movie is an animated anomaly, and it's the perfect target for those people that make videos about weird animated movies. So I guess I just wanted to make my own video before it fell into the wrong hands. Flatland, you're weird, but you're mine kind of weird. Flatland the film gets an 8.5 M&Ms out of 10. Are you gonna leave? Like, I don't have anything to do. W wanna hang out? N no. Uh, okay. Can you give me a ride home? Just get out. Oh, uh, okay. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Shootin' and Putin. I hope to see you next time.